This episode of Gun Blog Variety Cast brought to you by LawofSelfDefense.com. Go to LawofSelfDefense.com forward slash variety to learn about your state's self-defense laws. Sign up for one of their online or in-person seminars or buy the book Law of Self-Defense and get 10% off when you use the discount code variety at checkout. That's LawofSelfDefense.com forward slash variety. Sit back, relax, and take a ride with us on the Gun Blog Variety Cast, Episode 75. Welcome back to the Gun Blog Variety Cast. I'm your host, Sean, from NC Gun Blog, and with me today is Adam from Guns, Cars, Tech Blog. How are you doing, Adam? Snowpocalypse 2016. Version one. <laughs> I have a feeling there's going to be more than one. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, great. Let's get started with the tactical dog and fitness report. Five dog walking miles this week because I've been sick since the last podcast. You can hear, can't you? Yes. Sounds very familiar. Yeah. I've been trying to recover since then. The poor dog has been getting half mile walks every day, twice a day, if she is lucky. Poor girl. Oh, my goodness. I've been sleeping in the other room just so that my coughing doesn't keep the wife awake. Yeah. It's been freaking miserable. Hopefully it won't last four to six weeks like mine did. I don't have an idiot doctor. Uh, my doctor will fill me full <laughs> of whatever is necessary to knock this down. In fact, Monday, if the coughing isn't better, I'm going in and getting the same uh, steroid injection you got, and that'll be the end of that. Of course, my problem was not the idiot doctor. It was the idiot patient that they can go for four weeks. There's that. <laughs> so uh we got today at my house four inches of snow i measured it i've lived in nashville for 25 years and i've never seen four actual inches of snow i've seen it forecasted a lot a whole lot but it never pans out because nashville is surrounded by like this crater called the highland rim and it makes weather forecasting really really hard here uh, by the way my sister lives in nashville proper and she got seven inches tactical dog since this is the tactical dog and fitness report Tactical dog. Loved it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've got uh, I've got a video. Uh, I'm going to put it up on YouTube. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes of the dog running around like a crazy person in the snow out front. And it's hilarious. Yeah, we didn't get much in the way of snow. What we got was ice and sleet and rain and, and more sleet. And it's nasty. I didn't leave the house. I, I walked the dog twice and that was it. So the funny thing was is that I woke up this morning at 5.30 like I normally do and checked one of the news sites and my employer was not listed on one of the, as one of the places that was closed. So I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And then at 6, my wife says, hey, so did you look at the weather? I was like, yeah. And then she started saying something about me not going into work. I was like, what? No, why would I not go into work? She's like, oh, no, your office is closed. I go, oh, okay. So I go outside and I walk the dog and I'm like, eh, this is, this is nothing. I mean, it was a little slushy. Right. I was like, right. This, is, this is nothing. Go back inside. I'm like, yeah, no, I think I think I'm just going to go on in. Ten minutes later, there's like a half inch of snow on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, well, never mind. Yeah. I had planned the night before by calling the places that I had to go for my work. And I said, look, if the weather's bad, what do you want to do? And they're like, oh, we could totally reschedule if that's what you want to do. We'll, we're <laughs> totally OK with you rescheduling. <laughs> and I'm like. Oh, I would totally reschedule it if that's okay with you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, Sean, we would totally reschedule. Nobody wanted to see anybody today. <laughs> we were all really happy to be real nice to each other. And so I figured, you know, this is like carrying an umbrella. Right. In case it might rain, right? We were totally set, right? And this is like, you know, probably like you, the transition zone where – a degree here or there, and it changes from, oh my goodness, it's going to snow, to pissy rain and it's nasty. Right. Well, it didn't pissy rain and it's nasty. It was sleet and gross. I got up in the morning and I took the dog outside and went, there's no way I'm going anywhere. So I called all three of the locations. I'm like, forget it. And they're like, don't worry. We don't want to see you. We're not going out <laughs> in this. Forget it. So, yeah, no way. Nothing. Uh-uh. The, the whole state shut down. 
and I don't want to hear it from all you stupid Yankees. Nobody drives in this. You wouldn't drive in this. You don't drive in what's going on up there, so I don't want to hear it from you. And when the sun comes out, and it all melts off. It's just the same as if you guys took your plow trucks out and plowed it. The roads will be clear. There you go. We'll drive in that. So now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister in the gun blog sphere, Aaron Paulette. This week, Aaron talks about the importance of having trade goods. Come on, every pony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Aaron Paulette. <laughs> Aaron, last week you talked about the value of knowing how to barter. But I don't grow crops, or raise chicken, or bake bread. So how will this help me? Knowing how to barter is only part of the equation. You also have to have something people will want that you can barter with. And these are called trade goods. The ideal trade good is something which stores easily, lasts forever, and has universal appeal. Now, food has universal appeal after disaster. Everyone has to eat. But unless it's canned, it doesn't store easily, and it definitely doesn't last forever. So unless you're a farmer, food is too valuable to trade away unless it's under dire circumstances. You're going to be keeping it for yourself and your family. Now, on the opposite end of that spectrum are precious metals like gold and silver. These commodities only have value while we have a working economy. So they are a good hedge against inflation, as we discussed last week. But if things truly fall apart, precious metals become attractive but useless lumps. You can't eat them. You can't make useful things from them. At that point, copper wiring becomes more useful than gold or silver because you can at least repair electronics with copper. There are, however, some forms of metal which definitely have value after a disaster, and unlike gold and silver, they have a use besides sitting in your closet. I refer, of course, to that classic triad of steel, brass, and lead. Ammunition is likely the one thing preppers are going to have in abundance post-disaster. So as long as you keep your ammo in a cool, dry place, like a waterproof ammunition box inside your house, those cartridges are going to last effectively forever. However, ammunition is much like food in that most people would rather keep it for themselves than give it away. And this is compounded by the worry that, should things get truly bad, you might be giving someone the means to kill you. But there are some times when you ought to consider trading away that ammo. If you are leaving and cannot carry all that ammunition with you, it's certainly better to trade it for something useful, like provisions or fuel or means of transport. As a bonus, since you're leaving the area, it will be difficult for those bullets to be used against you. If you have ammunition that doesn't fit a firearm you own, uh, maybe the gun broke or you lost it, then you're better off finding a use for it than just sitting on it. If it's in a really oddball caliber, you might be able to sell it for parts to someone who does reloading. Just be sure that you trade it to someone that you trust. And speaking of reloading, if you have enough components like brass, primers, powder, and the like, you can effectively become a merchant by reloading and selling that ammunition. And if you are the only person in the area who knows how to reload, then your skills and knowledge become quite valuable. But if you don't want to trade any of your ammunition, another good medium of exchange is steel in the form of knives. The nice thing about knives is that you can use them instead of just having them take up space. And as so long as you take care of them, they are still valuable for trade. Unlike ammunition, knives are more tool than weapon. And even if they are used in violence, they're much less effective than a gun. So you might be more willing to trade a knife to someone that you wouldn't trust with bullets. Just make sure you don't trade away your only knife. That is completely irresponsible. Now, the kind of knives you stock up on is up to you. There is a utility in having more than one length, so an assortment of folding pocket knives, fixed knives, and longer blades like machetes would be best. But if you can only buy one kind of knife, I would recommend the Mora Craft Lion in stainless steel. They're large enough to do all sorts of useful work, but not so large that they scream stabbing weapon. Another metal that preppers would do well to stock up on is sodium, also known as salt. A daily intake of salt is critical for maintaining good health, but it has other applications as well. It can be used to preserve meats so that they don't spoil. It can make bad-tasting food more appealing. And in fact, this is far more important than you realize. There is a condition called appetite fatigue, 
which occurs when people have to eat the same foods over and over again. Just imagine having to eat beans and rice for months, if not years. After a while, these people become so sick of eating the same things that their body just decides they'd rather not eat them, and they'd actually rather starve than eat more of the same thing. And the best way to combat appetite fatigue is through use of spices and seasonings. So in addition to salt, other things to stock up on include honey, sugar, vanilla extract, cocoa powder, soy sauce, pepper, garlic, vinegar, and various cooking wines. In fact, all forms of alcohol make amazing trade goods because, as I've mentioned earlier, alcohol has medical and sanitary uses in addition to its utility as a recreational beverage. And going down that same path, anything sin-related is going to be in high demand after disaster. So, in addition to your booze, cigarettes, coffee, and yes, even pornography is going to go a long way with someone who is craving some. And as an added bonus, if you get busted by your significant other for having any of these, you can just say, don't worry, baby, that's just my stash of trade goods for after disaster. I'm sure that line is going to go over real well with my wife. (laughs) Thanks, Aaron. It's good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. See you next week, Sean. If you'd like to read more from Erin, check out her blog, lurkingrhythmically.blogspot.com. Felons behaving badly. Durham cousins charged in summer shooting of taxi driver. That sounds like a horrible TV show movie tie-in, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Dateline, Durham, North Carolina. Two Durham cousins were arrested this week in connection to a shooting of a taxi driver that occurred last summer. Suspect 125 was arrested Tuesday, and Suspect 218 was arrested Thursday afternoon. Both were charged with attempted first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and felony conspiracy. The charges are in connection to a June 30th incident on the 500 block of Hardy Street. Officers said they found the 28-year-old taxi driver with a gunshot wound to his stomach. The driver told authorities that he had gotten a call for a taxi ride and was approached by two males as he walked to the vehicle. The cousins then forced the driver into an apartment and one held him while the other shot him, said police. Suspect 1 and Suspect 2 were held at the Durham County Jail on Thursday night. Suspect 1 was being held under $2.5 million bond, while bond had not been set for Suspect 2. So that's kind of a weird story. It's kind of strange. Hmm. Cousins. Yes. 25 and 18. Yes. Young, early enough in their life that you think, well, you know, maybe, maybe they were just, you know, not yet old enough to have criminal records, both of them. Suspect number one, DWI level five, misdemeanor non-class code, drug paraphernalia used possess misdemeanor class one, possess with intent to sell schedule four, felon class I, common law robbery, felon class G, possession of a firearm by a felon, felon class G. That was the older of the two, the 25-year-old. What about the 18-year-old? Two counts felony breaking and entering conspiracy, felon class I. Two counts felony breaking and entering, felon class H. Larceny over a thousand, felon class H. Nice guys. The the family that breaks laws together goes to jail together, I guess? Hey, you know, maybe they'll get a group rate on the prison cell. I don't know. I guess, you know, they can all get visitation together. Iran seems bent on completing the comparison of Obama with President Carter. Only this time they release their hostages right away. I asked Nikki if this is a win or a fail for our side. Nikki, right before Barack Obama stated the Union address, Iran captured some American sailors. The administration claimed Iran promised to release them ASAP, and they did, the next day. Was that a foreign policy win or fail? Well, I think it's a little more nuanced than a simple win or fail. Sure, we got our guys back, and that can definitely be considered a win. We got them back quickly, and they haven't been harmed, as far as we know. So that's a win as well. And we didn't get involved in a costly war, so that's also a win. The Obama administration claims that establishing open lines of communication was what led to the release of our sailors. And that said communication was one consequence of the Iran deal from last summer. That said, some details are coming out that aren't exactly sitting right with some people. Photos of American sailors on their knees with their hands behind their heads are angering quite a few folks, and I think that's pretty much justified, as is the apology that was issued by their commander. 
Iran released another photo that shows our sailors relaxing with some pillows on the floor covered with some rugs. But a recent CNN report claimed that while the sailors weren't mistreated physically, probably because there wasn't enough time for that, there appears to have been some indication of duress. The commander who apologized on camera has indicated he felt pressure to talk about how well they were treated, and it's not yet clear if he was directly ordered to apologize, according to that report. But the headline does say that the sailors were told to quote-unquote act happy by their captors. So what do you do? I guess you act happy, right? Meanwhile, Vice President Joe Biden denied there was any apology. He spoke on CBS this morning and claimed there was nothing to apologize for. He basically said when you have a problem with the boat, you apologize that the boat had a problem? No, there was no looking for any apology. This was just standard nautical practice. Nautical practice? Seriously? The commander who issued the apology is a Naval Academy graduate, so he knows about the code of conduct, even if Biden is completely clueless. And yes, he had to act according to that code. It requires American troops to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth, and evade answering further questions to the utmost of their ability. It requires they resist. And then there's the optics. So... Our sailors were captured right before Obama's final State of the Union address. They were held until the next day. And before they were released, Iranian TV bragged about Americans apologizing to Iran. And tons of propaganda footage was taken, especially of our guys on their knees, blindfolded with their hands behind their heads. Hussein Salami, I love that name, by the way, awesome, deputy commander of the IRGC, which was responsible for boarding the U.S. ships and arresting the sailors, claimed in recent remarks that the American sailors started crying after their arrest. But of course, you know, the kindness of the guard made them feel all calm. And then he bragged that the capture of the American sailors shows Iran's military supremacy in the region. Because, well, you know, they captured Americans. In a broken boat, drifting, but they captured Americans. Oh, that doesn't exactly paint a very flattering picture of a strong America, does it? And this was a pretty significant propaganda coup for Iran, considering how they made out in the nuclear deal. The Geneva Conventions, which govern military conflicts, ban the practice of parading prisoners for purposes of insults and propaganda. And yet, Iran seems to have done just that, even though they're signatories to said conventions. Is that why they kept our sailors overnight instead of returning them immediately upon finding simple mechanical failure? So it sounds like you don't think this was a win or a loss, but rather a wash. What I think is that it's way too early to tell. We can certainly celebrate the return of our guys, but at the same time, there are just some things we still don't know. So it's a bit too early for the Obama administration to be crowing about being vindicated in its efforts at conciliation with Iran. I would certainly like to know why our sailors weren't immediately released instead of being held until the next day. I'd like to know how they were really treated. Propaganda shots just don't tell the story. I'd like to know what, if anything, the Iranians did to our boats while they were in their custody. Remember the Chinese helicopter incident? Also, what was Iran promised in return for our military personnel? I find it hard to believe that there was just no quid pro quo. In other words, it's still early. We don't know everything. And it's very possible that we won't, because the mission and everything surrounding it could possibly be classified, too. All right, Nikki, it was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. You bet. Take care. Nikki blogs at thelibertyzone.com. Plug of the week. So, Sean, I started watching this show this week, and you and I were talking about this before this show. And uh, you've also watched an episode of The Man in the High Castle. Yeah, which is an isn't Amazon that like a series. Philip K. Dick book originally? Or? Yeah. I saw the pilot of that. I wanted to watch a few more, but the wife has had enough of dark, dreary, <laughs> difficult to watch TV shows out of me. So I've had to put that on hold. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's all we watch is dark stuff. Like, yeah, I don't have to watch Downton Abbey with my wife. Of course, you... I would totally watch Downton Abbey with right. your wife. <laughs> In fact, I'm in the midst of watching season five right now, so... Yeah, but anyway, 
the premise of the man in the high castle is that the Nazis, well, the Axis powers won World War II and America I get is the, divided I, Actually, up. I got the impression that the Nazis won and the Japanese are just sort of there as, you know, tolerated by the Nazis. Yeah, the Japanese empire is definitely significantly weaker than uh, the Nazis. What happened was after they took America, they divided everything to the west of the Rocky Mountains belongs to the Japanese. It's the Japanese Pacific states. And then everything to the east of the Rockies is Nazi America, which I can't remember exactly what they call it, but that all belongs to the Germans. Except they never call them the Germans. It's always the Nazis, which I find a little bit strange. But then in between is the neutral zone, which apparently neither the Nazis nor the Japanese actually have governance over, but they both have agents in it. And it's some sort of buffer zone, I guess, to prevent, I mean, really ostensibly to prevent the Nazis from mounting an invasion of the Pacific states. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> they really don't seem to like each other. At least the one episode that I saw, they really don't seem to like each other very much. Yeah, they definitely don't trust each other. They seem more allies of convenience than of love. Yes. It's like, oh, well, you know, we did this thing together and, oh, wow, you Nazis, you you were kind of serious about that whole like white supremacy thing. Right. But, you know, let's face it, the uh, Japanese are pretty racist. Yeah, well. Especially World War II Japanese. Yeah. They certainly were absolutely as racist as the Nazis ever thought about being. So put those two cats in a bag and see how that goes. Come on now. <laughs> and and that does come out in, in the later episodes that I've seen. Now, I've only seen up to episode four. Uh, you've only seen the first episode. Right. But again, it was it was based on a book that was written in the 60s. I have no idea. It was Philip K. Dick, so it was a while ago. Yeah. It's about, you know, 1967, 68, I think, in, in the show. So, yeah, it's all about some little uh, resistance going on. And there is this, mag well, I don't want to say magical, but kind of mythical man in the high castle everybody's trying to get to. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's a it's a fairly standard, you know, there's somebody somewhere who's the leader of the resistance. Yeah. Or but does he really exist? You know. It's it's pretty neat. It's the the first episode really grabs you and I really want to watch the rest of it. And at some point, you know, my wife will take a trip and I will binge watch the rest of the season. <laughs> So yeah, Man in a High Castle, absolutely watch that. Man in a High Castle is Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it for free. So Amazon Prime, go to Amazon Video. Um, I got that via my Roku box. So I watch it on Roku. I don't know how else you can see it, but you can watch it on Amazon Video. I guess you can watch it online on your computer. Yeah, that's what we do. So our main television is just got a, a computer hooked up to it. Um, and so that's how we, we watch most of our stuff. Fun with headlines. All right. So this isn't so much a fun with headlines as a reporter not doing their job. Sheriff advises citizens to arm themselves. Advocates say more education needed. Dateline Nashville. In light of the recent terror attacks in the U.S. and abroad, several public officials have urged citizens to arm themselves. The list of leaders includes three Tennessee sheriffs. Last week, Decatur County Sheriff Keith Byrd sent a letter to the Tennessee Farms Association addressing the importance of personal safety. Not only do I recommend it, I encourage them to, Byrd said. I'm going to skip a little bit down and to, uh, to the more important part of the article. Opponents argue that the prospect of countless armed citizens is more frightening than an unknown terror attack. I do feel like it's stirring fear where it doesn't need to be, said Beth Jocelyn Roth with Safe Tennessee Project. Safe Tennessee Project works to prevent gun violence. Roth said one eight-hour class is not nearly enough to learn how to properly handle a firearm, especially in a life-or-death situation. She said accidental shootings pose a far greater risk. Terrorism is something we should be mindful of, but I don't think it's the imminent threat that the news stories that I see come across my desk multiple times every day are, Roth said. So let's break that down. So terrorism is something we should be mindful of, but the multiple stories she sees coming across her desk every day are, in fact imminent threats yeah and these consist of apparently accidental shootings by people with carry permits which are in fact at historical lows right like so low that like 
we have trouble counting them that low. Right. So, so I, I read this and I was like, well, that's, that's kind of a weird thing to say. One eight-hour class is not nearly enough to learn how to properly handle a firearm, especially in a life or death situation. Now, I will tell you that an eight-hour class is plenty long enough to learn how to properly handle a firearm. You can do it in, in 30 minutes. I can teach you how to properly handle a firearm. Seriously. I think what she meant was train for an active shooter scenario and taking out multiple bad guys, which is not what the carry permit class is for. But that's what that's what the sheriffs were saying. You know, you need to if you're a concealed handgun permit holder, you need to, you know, you carry your gun so that you can take down the bad guys. If if like ISIS attacks, you're going to be there and you're going to be able to jump up and strap your guns on and attack them and right and shoot them down. And notice that she doesn't really say, well, you're not going to be able to do that. What she says is, well, you know, accidental shootings are probably more dangerous than that. She doesn't say you're not going to make a difference in that scenario. She says, shoot your eye out. Yes. So the one eight hour class is not nearly enough to learn how to properly handle a firearm, especially in a life or death situation. You know, I hear that a lot from people who claim to be gun safety advocates. Well, there's just not enough training. So, you know, if I was this reporter, I would have said, oh, OK, cool. One hour class is not long enough. How much training would you be comfortable with as a gun safety advocate? And of course, we know the answer is infinite. The answer for this lady is, is just get shot by the terrorist peasant. You don't get a gun. We don't want you to have one. Yes. So remember, she says, well, yes, terrorism is something that we should be mindful of, but accidental shootings are what we should really be worried about. Right. Right. What she says is, shoot your eye out. So, so let's go to this press release that Safe Tennessee Project put out in conjunction with this news story that I had to find on my own. I couldn't find it anywhere else. It's actually not even on their website. It's on like a mailing list site. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think I know what you're talking about. Permit holders in Tennessee undergo an eight-hour class to get their permit. Part of that class is spent on basic gun safety and part is spent on the range. Compare that to 120 plus hours of training that Metro Nashville police officers undergo and the continuing education and yearly certification requirements they must fulfill. Topics covered include shoot and don't shoot scenarios, how to clear a room, how to escalate and de-escalate scenarios. Police officers also undergo active shooter training specifically designed to train officers for the extraordinarily dangerous possibility of a heavily armed shooter in a public populated place. This training is conducted by experts experienced and well-trained in managing active shooter events. Okay, so they get 120 hours of training plus yearly stuff, right? And it includes the stuff that the sheriffs were talking about, right? Okay, so that's that's a three-week class, right? Then they go on to say, and even with all of that training, police officers still make mistakes. In high-stress situations when the adrenaline is pumping, even trained professionals sometimes shoot when they shouldn't shoot. So she's saying that even after three weeks of training... Shoot your eye out. Right. So apparently, 120 hours of firearms training by Metro Nashville Police Department is not enough for the Safe Tennessee Project. Good to know. And I feel like I should say this now. Metro Nashville Police Department does like 950 hours of training before they let you be a police officer, but you can go and be a reserve police officer just by like showing up to a small town police station and saying, hey, I want to be a cop. (laughs) <laughs> and then you have to undergo 40 hours of training a year, but only like four of that is with firearms. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. One of the things they just don't seem to understand here is, is that shoot, don't shoot. See, that applies if there's a question to be had. If there's a guy with a gun and he is mowing people down, he has defined the relationship already. Yes. You don't have to define that relationship any further. You don't have to ask yourself at that point, do I have to shoot him? That decision's already been made. Right. Okay, so the shoot, don't shoot, you don't, need to, you don't need to ask yourself that question. So how to clear a room? You don't need to clear a room. You just need to shoot the loser who's murdering all the people in the room. Escalate and de-escalate a situation? You don't need to escalate the situation. He's shooting people. You don't. There's no way to escalate that. <laughs> and de-escalating a situation like that, you shoot the guy in the face. That's how you de-escalate an, an active shooter like that. You shoot him. 
Because we all know the way that active shooters in this country work, except for the San Bernardino terrorists, prohibited person walks into a gun-free zone, starts murdering people, and stops only when met with armed resistance. Pretty much. And they either get shot or they shoot themselves. Yep. So the faster an armed person shows up to resist them, the faster they get shot or they shoot themselves. Right. We've tried to prevent number one with the Gun Control Act of 1968. Fail. We tried to prevent number two. Well, they show up to a gun-free zone, right? So we tried to... So we make more gun-free zones. Good job. Yeah. Fail. Right. Right. And then, you know, number three is the thing that number one and number two is supposed to prevent. But we all know that laws don't prevent things. They just punish things after they've happened. Yep. Good job. Right. Fail. So what you're you're telling me is, Safe Safe Tennessee Project, is that you want to make make sure that there is the maximum possible amount of time between when that guy starts shooting and when he stops shooting. You know, when you start to analyze what they do and what they say, sometimes you have to wonder, do they really want what they say they want or are they just lying to you? Hmm. We've heard that the state of New York is considered banning encrypted smartphones. Barron tells us why he thinks that's a really bad idea in Tech Tips, Tech Tech Tips, tips, Tech tech Tips. You are damaging my calm. Tech Tips with the Baron. Baron, I think you've talked about this before, but have you heard about the latest idiocy coming out of New York? What, they're banning medium-sized drinks now too? Can't have people exercising their freedom of choice? Well, New York is looking to ban encrypted smartphones. In the words of the immortal goose, you're going to do what? So, this crap is having trouble gaining traction at the federal level, and rightfully so because it's so retarded for so many different reasons. Crippling and making innocent people vulnerable in the name of national security doesn't work, but it's the only card they know how to play, so now let's see them playing it outside the firearms arena. The stated reason for this, like everything nowadays, is... Terrorism! As you know, if the police don't have instant and complete access to all your text messages and cat photos during a traffic stop, the terrorists have won! On devices running iOS 8 and later versions, your personal data is placed under a protection of your passcode. For all devices running iOS 8 and later versions, Apple will not perform an iOS data extraction in response to government search warrants because the files to be extracted are protected by an encryption key that is tied to the user's passcode and unknown by Apple. This is also true for Google, Android phones. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether or not it's true for Windows phones. But the fact of the matter is, is the companies in question do not hold the keys to get back in. So let's say for the sake of argument that this law passes. Will this affect those outside the state of New York? That is actually a distinct possibility. If this was the state of California, I would definitely say yes. While encryption can largely be implemented in software after the fact, the most likely answers are going to be to implement algorithms with backdoors or otherwise known as two keys. This is bad because the second key will be found. And when it is, well, personally, I'm going to pay money so that I can get copies of, you know, any politician who voted for this crap's phone or the physical phones themselves so that I can lock, unlock it. And once I've unlocked it, I'm publishing the contents to the world. The fact is, if you have two keys and one of them's quote unquote universal, anyone with it can open it. Think of it this way. Do those TSA locks do any good keeping your luggage secure? No, everybody's got a copy of those keys. Hell, you can grab them off Thingiverse and print a copy of them yourself. So who in their right minds thinks that doing this to digital locks, the ones that protect our email, private photos, and bank accounts, would say that anyone can have access? And despite what these politicians claim, there will be no protecting that second key. You're going to have to disclose it to law enforcement, and that guarantees it's going to be leaked and used in the wild. Is there anything we can do? Well, the New York Assembly doesn't really care about you unless you're a resident, so not so much on this current fight. Unless you're a resident, in which case, contact your reps and bitch them the hell out. Sadly, if this becomes a thing, phones one way or another will probably become considerably less secure and a larger target for criminal enterprise. Thank your local government. As always, screwing the citizen for the sake of criminal enterprise. Well, that's less than promising. All right, Baron, it was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. See you next week, Sean. Baron still blogs at the-minuteman.org. And I would like to point out that there are certain industries where 
executives and whatnot might get email on their phone, and that email contains information that by federal law must be encrypted. (laughs) So how's that going to work? Whoops. (laughs) The J Block. High court. You can beat up a burglar without breaching their human rights. So this is a story out of England. Oh, right. Yeah. Didn't they lose a war? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) They lost something, I swear. It's interesting looking at England and looking at the United States and the differences in laws. Because here in the United States, pretty much if you break into somebody's house, it's on. And nobody has any real sympathy for you. So back in 2013, this guy named Denby Collins either wandered into the wrong house at 3 a.m. totally by mistake, or he decided to rob a home. You know, it depends on who you ask. So the homeowner snatches him up, tackles him, holds him until the coppers arrive. They promptly handcuff him. When they realize that Mr. Collins is not responsive, they rush him to the hospital, and to this day, he's still in a coma. Well, mom and dad Collins are pretty upset, and they want Mr. Homeowner charged with the high crime of being a big fat meanie to an uninvited guest which is apparently a much bigger deal in Old Blighty than it is here in the United States. I suppose they expected the homeowner would serve tea and crumpets whilst awaiting emergency services response. Now, Adam, in most U.S. jurisdictions, if a person kicks in your door at 3 a.m., what's the socially accepted show of hospitality? Buckshot. You see, here in the United States, we don't weigh out things like proportionate and disproportionate. When it comes to castle law, if you are on somebody else's occupied property forcibly and unlawfully, they are presumed in fear of their life, and they can use deadly force. Say goodnight, Gracie. Our view has long been that if you break into somebody else's home, you forfeit any right to your life. If you wanted to live, you wouldn't go around begging people to shoot you, now would you? Well, Mom and Dad Collins, being unswayed by common sense arguments like, well, what was this homeowner supposed to do? Let your son rob and murder him and his whole family while waiting for the police? Decided to take their case to court, and sued to have the homeowner charged with something, anything, for disproportionately using excessive force or something against their son, who was probably actually not robbing the place at 3 a.m. He was probably just in the wrong place at the wrong time or something. Quoting from the story, Householders can use, quote, disproportionate level of force to protect themselves against intruders in their home, the high court has confirmed in a landmark ruling. Backing the so-called, quote, householder defense, Judges said that the use of violence when challenging a burglar did not breach European human rights laws. They rejected a challenge to the defense by the family of Denby Collins, 39, who remains in a coma after being confronted and restrained while allegedly breaking into a home in Gillingham, Kent, at 3 a.m. in December 2013. The parents of Mr. Wrongway Collins had the gall to argue before the court that their son, who was inarguably in somebody else's home at 3 a.m., should not have been restrained by the homeowner because, according to European human rights law, he had a right to life. And apparently, had a right to live his life at 3 a.m. in somebody else's living room without getting tackled and forcibly restrained until the police got there. Does this make any sense to you, Adam? No. Is it any wonder that they can't understand us when we tell them to arm themselves? Is it any wonder that we can't understand them when they sneer at us for being willing to fight? This is completely insane. They consider it disproportionate force. Wrestling? Hold the guy down until the cops get there? That was disproportionate force? Yeah, I mean, he was just... I What? Uh, Gives a damn what he was doing. (laughs) He was breaking into the dude's house at 3 o'clock in the morning. If he got a beat upside the head with a cricket bat. If he got shot in the face with a shotgun. <laughs> they all act like, oh, well, you can't kill somebody for the hell I can't. Dude is breaking into your house at three o'clock in the morning, no less. What's he there for? Is he there for collecting for Christian relief? He's there to tell me the good news about Jesus? Maybe. You might meet Jesus after. Yeah. He can meet Jesus for me. He can tell me I'm on my way. I'll be there when I get there. Hey, Jesus, I just saw Sean. He says he's on his way. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. Later, better than sooner. I got things to do. And now, word from our sponsor. You know what will happen. If you ever have to defend yourself, you're going to end up in handcuffs. Are you trained to win the fight after the fight? Sure, you can draw, aim, and put two in the ten ring, but have you learned your legal self-defense? Do you know the law? Go to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash variety to sign up for your legal self-defense class. 
Each class is tailored to the laws in your state. Attorney Andrew Branca will teach you the law, not just what the law says, but what the judge's legal opinions say, what the jury instructions say. Sure, you could risk spending the rest of your life in prison because you followed the advice of some gun store counter jockey, or you could spend the day with the man who literally wrote the book on the law of self-defense. Carry a gun so you're hard to kill. Know the law so you're hard to convict. Go to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash variety to sign up for a legal self-defense class in your state. And make sure to use discount code variety at checkout to receive 10% off. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the donate or subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. A little help from you is a big help to us. In his continuing series on President Obama's disastrous CNN town hall, Weird heads into week two with The Lies, part two. In This, this week, week in Anti Gun Nuttery. So, hey, Weird, I hear you have a special Weird Beard fan club and that you have a special message to the littlest member of that Weird Beard fan club. Hi, Doodlebug. Daddy loves you. <laughs> uh, My daughter was listening to the show the other day and she thought I was a movie star. She's like, Daddy, you're on the radio. So what do you got for us this week? So last week, I only got halfway through Obama's opening with Anderson Cooper at the CNN Town Hall on gun violence. Time is short, so let's finish up the stragglers. What used to be a small exception that said collectors and uh, hobbyists don't need to go through a background check has become this massive industry where people who are doing business are in fact saying that they're not in the business of selling guns, but are. And all we're saying here is is that we want to put everybody on notice that the definition of doing business, which means you have to register, and it means you have to run a background check, is if you are making a profit and repeatedly selling guns, then you should have to follow the same rules as every other gun dealer. So I've been comparing Obama's executive orders to the clock boy in Texas. Essentially, this kid bought a commercial digital clock then took it apart and put the parts in a briefcase and told anybody who would listen at his school that he built a clock. President Obama, like Clock Boy, is repeating the Gun Control Act of 1968 and implying that A, it hasn't been the law federally for nearly a half century, and B, that his executive orders have created the Gun Control Act of 1968. The intent of the law is pretty clear, and anybody who's done a lot of buying and trading a firearm should be aware of it. The letter isn't so clear on where the magic line of a legal sale of a very active collector crosses into a black market's arms dealer, and of course, our brave leader won't clarify that either. My suspicion is that the real reason that Obama doesn't want to paint a bright line between safe, legal, ordinary behavior and illegal operating as a dealer without a federal firearms license is he wants to scare you into not selling guns at all. This is not an attempt to regulate gun sales. This is an attempt to chill gun sales. What we ultimately need, I believe, is for Congress to set up a system that is efficient, that doesn't inconvenience the lawful gun seller or purchaser, but that makes sure that we're doing the best background check possible. This is why I'm so excited about how this town hall went. Obama is anti-gun and came into office with hopes of banning guns. Despite multiple political pushes to ban guns, he's been thwarted by Congress, mostly because the American people won't stand for gun control and know that gun banners do nothing but make empty promises. So having been thwarted one too many times, the president declares that he's going to do an executive order that will accomplish his gun control dreams. And his orders are just as empty as his promises. Which leads and demand that Congress take action. Rinse, repeat. This is really an amazing event for the Second Amendment advocates. For the gun owners who are in attendance here, my suspicion is is that you all had to go through a background check. And it didn't prevent you from getting a weapon. And the notion that you should have to do that, but there are a whole bunch of folks who are less responsible than you who don't have to do it, doesn't make much sense. Let's translate that from politician speech. 
Hey, all of you people had to beg and plead with the federal government before we allowed you to access your fundamental enumerated individual constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Why should Bob down the street be allowed to buy a used hunting rifle from his buddy within the same state without begging the same permission you had to beg? You got your rights trampled. Don't you want to see him get his rights trampled too? Now we know this does nothing to keep Ice Dog from selling Ray Ray a stolen Sigma out of the trunk of his pimped out Grand Marquis down on Dot Ave in Southie. That's not what this is about. This is about hassling you, making traceable records of your firearms purchase so that we have that registry they say they don't want to have. Let's face it, if we really cared about criminals buying guns, we'd actually prosecute the ones we catch trying to buy guns. There's nothing else in our lives that we purchase where we don't try to make it a little safer if we can. Traffic fatalities have gone down drastically during my lifetime. And part of it is technology, and part of it is that the National Highway Safety Administration does research and they figure out, you know what, seatbelts really work. And then we pass some laws to make sure seatbelts are fastened. Airbags make a lot of sense, let's try those out. So before we get too deep into the weeds here, guns are safe. If you have an old revolver, many of those can't be carried with a full cylinder. Many old semi-autos can't be carried with a loaded chamber, even if the safety is on. Modern guns, many which don't even have a manual safety at all, are virtually bomb-proof. The only way to shoot them is to pull the trigger. There have been tons of gun recalls from various manufacturers, and I can't think of any that have been initiated because of an injury, let alone a death. So now into cars. The big reason why auto fatalities are down is people are driving less. Also, why does nobody talk about the first generation American airbags that actually killed people if they were shorter than average height? Granted, like guns, we've made airbags safer and that isn't as much of a concern, unless your car has one of those faulty airbags made by Takata. Toys. We say, you know what, we find out that kids are swallowing toys all the time. Let's make sure that the toys aren't so small that they swallow them if they're for toddlers or infants. This is his actual argument? It doesn't even stand up. Toddlers can't play with toys with small pieces, but bigger kids can. Younger kids shouldn't have some toys that are only suited for older kids and so on and so forth. Get all the way up to you and I, grown-up people with lives, careers, maybe even kids of our own. Yep, we're responsible enough to own and use guns. This wasn't even attempted an argument. Medicine. Kids can't open aspirin caps. Now, the notion that we would not apply the same basic principles to gun ownership as we do to everything else that we own, but you just know, to try to make them safer, or the notion that anything we do to try to make them safer is somehow a plot to take away guns, that contradicts what we do to try to create a, a better life for Americans in every other area of our lives. So here he's directly driving at the smart gun argument. I keep my medicine in childproof containers away from where my daughter can reach them. Same goes for guns. You want your kids not to have an accident with your gun? Carry it or lock it up. It doesn't take a high dollar safe to keep kids away from guns. As for the pro-gun opposition to smart guns, it's really been a straw man. We don't care what guns are on the market. What we oppose is laws that mandate that the only guns sold are so-called smart guns, which is the anti's goal. So just so I'm clear, tonight you're saying you would welcome to meet with the NRA. I'm ha I, uh, Anderson, I, I've said this repeatedly. I'm, I'm happy to meet with them. I'm happy to talk to them. But the conversation has to be based on facts and truth. So, Mr. President, you're willing to meet with the NRA? The NRA has issued a challenge to a fair debate with the president. I'll meet you for a one-on-one, -on -one, one hour debate with a mutually agreed upon moderator on any network that will take it. No pre-screen questions and no gas bag answers. Do you think he'll take them up on it? As for conversations based on facts and truth, now I'm doing this for the second week and how many lies has he told? I'll be back next week with Obama feeling those pre-screened questions. All right, Weird. It was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. I'll blow your doors off with what I got next week, Sean.
In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on the Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Stuff that grinds my gears. People confuse me explaining something with agreeing with that something. Kelly Grayson actually posted something. Uh, the ambulance driver posted on his Facebook page this uh, this discussion of, I think it was New Haven. I don't remember. Some place, I think it was someplace in Connecticut. They won't hire smart people to be cops. Yes, I remember that. Like they, they give you an intelligence test if you score between 22 and 27, which corresponds to about average intelligence to slightly above average intelligence or something like that within a standard deviation above average intelligence they'll hire you if you're wildly above average intelligence they don't want you their attitude is and they said directly people who are really smart don't stick around they get bored they think this job is boring they don't like it they leave as soon as they get trained we've wasted all our money we're not hiring them. This seems like a reasonable thing to say, honestly. Right. As much as I would like to see police officers be smart people and not stupid people, uh, you know what? If they're all going to leave as soon as you train them, you just wasted your money. Right. There's also another argument to be had. If you've got really smart people who are bored with what they are doing on an assembly line job or on a job that requires them to do boring things for a long period of time that they thought might be exciting, but actually require a lot of driving around and paying attention to little details, but not actually doing anything. And then like suddenly reacting to things and then like going back to doing nothing for a long time, they start looking for crap to do. And frequently they require a lot of supervision. (laughs) Have you ever heard of Skippy's list? It's like this list of things that Skippy is not allowed to do. And that sounds funny. It is. It, it is. It's a list of things that Skippy, it was like specialist Skippy uh, is not allowed to do because it was stuff that Skippy got in trouble for doing when he was, he was, a, he was in Bosnia or something like that. And he kept getting in trouble for different things. So he started making a list of all the things he got in trouble for doing. <laughs> Skippy is not allowed to do these things anymore. <laughs> he, was, he was in the army. Is what it was. You know, right. Skippy is no longer allowed to tell German soldiers that we kicked your butt in World War II. Skippy is no longer allowed to tell, uh, you know, whatever. And it's right. just this long list of things that Skippy's no longer allowed to do. Uh, I think Daddy Bear does something similar to that uh, that his wife has told him he's no longer allowed to do. This sometimes happens to really high functioning people who are in jobs that require them to be bored a lot of the time. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't hire smart people to do that sort of job, but there are a certain subset of people, I am one of them, that you do not put in a job that requires them to drive around in a car all the time, bored out of their freaking minds, because people like me start looking for stuff to do. Don't you drive a car around a lot? Right, but... What I do for a living requires me to drive to a location and do a particular function. But the actual driving part of it is just driving. I am not patrolling an area as a police officer. Looking for things to do. Looking for things to do, exactly. I am not attempting to entertain myself during that period of time and therefore causing trouble and requiring supervision. This is not to say that every smart person would cause this problem, but I did advance the theory on the thread that there were a certain number of smart people who would cause problems in this situation. And perhaps one of the reasons that they didn't want a large number of smart, overly smart people in the job of police officer is that they had found that it caused too much trouble and too much supervision required. And so. They decided we're just not going to hire them. In addition to the stated reason, which was they didn't stick around because they were bored on the job. Well, n- naturally, I'm a smart person hater because, you clearly. know, clearly, I, clearly, I hate, I, I, you know, oh, only only dumb people can be cops, I guess. Uh, you know, therefore, I hate cops. No one could have predicted this. <sighs> you hate cops and smart people at the same time. At the same time, I guess. And I'm really smart and I talk down to everybody and I'm just not understanding how, look, just because I advance a particular theory as to why people would think a certain way does not mean I agree with this. Retweets are not endorsements.
Right. If I explain <laughs> something, if if you ask for an explanation of why somebody might think something, and I say, well, here's what they might be thinking, does not necessarily mean I think that. I might understand it. I might think it's a valid thought. I might think it's the dumbest effing thing I've ever heard in my life. But if you want to know what I think they are thinking, I will tell you what I think they are thinking. We do that on a good portion of this podcast. Right. This is what we think that Barack Obama is thinking when he says yes. this thing. Right. This is what people do is they say, look, judging by what we see, this must be where they're coming from. Now, does this make sense? Is this reasonable? It could be. Could be not. Do the best you can with this. Now, I don't want stupid cops. I want the people who are coming to rescue my butt because you know what? They're not coming to arrest me. It's not like I'm going to be doing anything wrong. Now, if I was a criminal, I'd want the dumbest cops possible. I want them so stupid they couldn't figure out what I was doing. I'd want to be able to think rings around these guys. But as it is, the only reason the cops are coming to my house is to rescue my dumb ass because somebody is kicking the door in trying to hurt me. I want the smartest cops possible because I want them to come and I want them to, you know, use the fastest route to get here. I want them to be able to identify me because they know me and be able to shoot the right person and not me, not my wife and not my dog. And if the guy gets away, I want them to know all of the routes away from here and be able to track the guy down and snatch him up and throw him in jail. So I don't want stupid cops. I want smart ones. But if you ask me what I think that people are thinking and why they might act a certain way, don't attribute their thoughts to me. So, Adam, what about you? Dino trucks. What? Dino trucks. D-I-N-O-T-R-U-X. A Netflix original series by DreamWorks. This isn't clarifying anything for me. <laughs> I have a four-year-old. Well, he's, he's almost four. He's, he's three and 11 twelfths or something. He was really good today. So we had a snow day today and he was really good and he wanted to watch uh, a video. And so we we're like, eh, okay, sure. You can, you can watch something. And we were looking for some transformers, something. Uh, but then he saw this dino trucks poster and he, he said, he said, dad, robot dinosaurs. That sounds like the most awesome thing in the world. <laughs> right. And it's made by DreamWorks. So the characters are going to be cool. Right. And the animation is going to be awesome. Yeah. It's going to have a story. And all of those things are true. I don't even know how to describe this feeling, but like just rage started panning up inside me as I'm watching this little 20 minute show of these little cute robot dinosaurs driving around and making friends and stuff. Because here's the basic plot of the story for the the, the first episode. So the, the protagonist, Ty, who is a Tyrannosaurus Rex truck of some sort. And they're not really trucks. They're all like construction equipment because they're all tracked. Okay. He is in a, is in a valley and there's a, a volcano. And so he has to leave home. And so he goes over to this other valley and all these trucks they have to live on ore, right? So they're all eating rocks. Right? Uh-huh. They're eating, eating ore. And he's like, oh, look, here's some ore. And he you know goes around and, and gets some and whatever. And he's there for a couple of days. And then this other Tyrannosaurus Rex truck comes over and basically says, hey, what are you doing? And Ty goes, oh, hi. Yeah, I know it's supposed to only be one T-Rex per area, um, but there's plenty of food here. So I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And the, the bad guy, right, is like, uh, this stuff is mine and you should not like not take it from me. It's just, he's like, no, get out of here. And... So then the protagonist calls the antagonist a bully for not wanting to share. Uh-huh. And the rest of the show is him going to other dino trucks, <laughs> gathering a gang up, and going back to beat this guy up to make him leave so that they can take all of the ore. So the bad guy is the one whose house they invaded and food they stole. <laughs> And he admits in the beginning of the show, I know this is your place, but I'm going to do it anyway. Maybe I'm overly sensitive and maybe this is one of those like dog whistle things because, you know, only the dogs hear it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But I was like, did that just happen? Like, what is this? So so they ran him out of his own house. Yeah, that does seem kind of strange. Yeah. What was he supposed to do? Share. All he had to do is share because there's plenty. Um, his stuff like it's his territory 
Well, that's our show for the week. Thanks again to Rob Allen for our music. And Firearms Policy Coalition for their support. And thank you for listening to Gunblog Variety Cast. Constructive criticism can be sent to Sean at SeanSarantino.com. And hate mail to WizardPC at GunsCarsTech.com. Like and share us on Facebook. If you have Facebook. And if you receive this podcast through iTunes, make sure to leave us a glowing five-star review. Show notes can be found at GunBlogVarietyCast.com forward slash episode 75. This is a URS production.